Hi there. Welcome back to From the Workshop with me, your host, Brandon Hart. You have clicked on part three of our crash course for GSMA, all about IoT device developers and incorporating LTE connectivity into your hardware design. Um, if you haven't watched part one and part two first, you're doing it wrong and should probably go back and watch parts one and two. Uh, we will have those linked below and, uh, and we'll see you in a little bit after you get done with those. For the rest of you, welcome back to part three and um, we are two thirds of the way through our crash course. This time we're going to focus uh, more on taking your prototype designs uh, through the uh, optimization of the hardware, um, getting things working properly and getting them out into production, deploying devices to the field and so on. Um, so I've got some examples here that we'll kind of talk through, but let's just jump straight in. Um, so I'm just going to start here first off. So uh, no matter what type of device you are designing, there is some sort of a development kit, some sort of, of dev board, dev kit uh, type of setup that you can work with. Um, again, whether that's you know a module based design, whether that's uh, an embedded modem like our Skywire modem, um, there's going to be some sort of development kit, development board that you can start with use it, take full advantage of these things because you can actually develop uh, and put together a uh, design that incorporates your sensors, pulls all the data, sends data over the LTE network or whatever you happen to be using. Um, and, and you can start generating a lot of the same data that you would normally be generating with a full custom board, but without having to get to that point at all. You start things off in a much simpler way and, uh, and that way also you can start to develop the application side, the server side of things and figure out what to do with that data as it comes in. Figure out how much data you're actually using, how much you're sending, how much you're receiving. Can you uh, reduce that? Can you reduce your costs and reduce your overhead and reduce your uh, power budgets and things like that by optimizing things at the dev kit level? Not only that, but once you are moving from the dev kit based proof of concept or prototype into a custom PCB, you've got the dev kit itself as your reference design. So it's already built in. You can basically take a lot of the example design, the example hardware that you've got in, in whatever form factor you're using and translate that directly into your own custom board design and your production device. So it's kind of a two for one. Not only can you prove out the use case, prove out how to make things work, prove out what to do with the data, how to reduce the amount of data you're using, but then you immediately take that same design and move it into your own custom PCB design. So works out really, really well that way. Um, so then you start getting into creating your own board optimizing your design um, uh, and, and, and making it custom, making it yours. At this point, you're going to do things like um, looking at all of the manufacturer guidelines. Again, whether it's the radio, whether it's the, the eSIM that you're using, whether it's the sensor that you're using, follow the manufacturer guidelines. I, I know it sounds like I'm telling you to read the manual, uh, and I guess I am, but um, that is the, the, the uh, reference designs that they include there, the guidelines that they provide in all of the documentation really does tell you how to design your board in a way that will make the best use of those components um, of the circuitry, etc. So really do pay attention to those things. Um, but ultimately, once you have your board in a state that you think is the final design, ask some questions. Ask questions of the manufacturer of the LTE module uh, or the embedded modem. Um, if that uh, company will offer a re design review capability, um, then take your actual design that you've put together, send it to them, have them look over it and tell you whether there's gonna be any potential issues or uh, problems with that design that might cause you problems uh, as you move forward into production. Uh, so just to throw it out there, Nimblelink does offer a free 
schematic review um, and we will look over your design based upon a Skywire modem. Make sure that all the circuitry, everything that you're doing isn't going to cause any issues for the Skywire. Make it uh, perform its best and we do recommend that you take full advantage of that free um, service. So, uh, <laughs> just needed to throw that out there because again, ask as many questions as you can. It'll save you thousands of dollars in uh, bad designs, hardware revs, board spins, um, or, you know, hopefully you don't get to this point, but bad devices that get to the field and get deployed. Um, that could be really bad. So avoid that if at all possible. Um, so you've had the, the board reviewed, you've asked all the questions you need to ask, you've optimized your board, uh, you're, you're quite confident then that the design that you want is the one you're going to spin, get your board spun, uh, make all of the, uh, you know, populate all the components, get your final device and test it. Test it in all sorts of different uh, scenarios. So as engineers, a lot of times things can be designed in what we'll call lab conditions or optimal conditions. And that's great for a lot of stuff, but when you are trying to design a radio that will go out into the real world, a lot of times lab conditions is not the best thing to base your testing on. So if you can stress test your device, especially for LTE connectivity, stress test the device as much as possible. Uh, throw some attenuators on your antenna connectors. Really put it into a, a bad signal area, a bad, you know, uh, uh, RF type of, of uh, environment and see how it handles it. This will be the situation where um, the module and the capabilities of the radio itself will uh, start to use the most power. We'll try to draw the most current. And when it does that, it'll be pretty clear pretty quickly whether or not your power circuitry is sufficient. If it's not, it may brown out. It may cause you problems. It may do some very odd things uh, that you can't really explain. And that may just be simply due to the fact that it's not able to source enough current or it's not able to source enough current quickly enough. Uh, and that may require some modifications to your design. Again, if you're using it in a good RF environment, a good signal environment, you may not experience those problems because it may never pull all that much current as it will when you put it in the real world and all of a sudden it's on the opposite side of multiple layers of corrugated metal or it's in a Faraday cage or something like that. You never know. Um, so test for those things ahead of time, if at all possible. During that testing, you wanna look for a couple of things. Obviously, how the power circuitry performs, how your, um, uh, how consistent, how reliable your RF capabilities are, but also check for noise in your circuitry. You can have great signal, but if your board is generating noise, if there's some sort of element or trace on the board that it's, that it's radiating um, RF noise, anything like that, the whole system will start to perform badly. So listen for, check for the, any of that RF noise in the design itself. Which takes you to production. You've tested it, everything's working great. You put attenuators on your signal, on your uh, antennas. You know that those, that your whole board design is able to handle bad RF environments or even noisy RF environments. Um, now you're going into production. You're not done testing. <laughs> Test your device at the end of the production line. So create test fixtures, uh, jigs that you can take your device uh, at, in its finished form, put it into the test jig and, and just make sure that things are working properly. Um, again, you really just don't want to put devices that are not working properly in the field. You're just making things a lot harder to fix at that point. Um, a lot of, uh, a lot of times this is also a really great point where, uh, to insert the SIMs, to, um, uh, initiate activation, um, power up your device and get it to pull down its APNs if your carrier supports that kind of thing. Um, and, and maybe to send a little bit of test data over the network just to make sure that everything is working properly. Um, not all use cases support that kind of thing, but if you can do the power on and, and the activation at the end of the line, then you're going to have a much better 
um, likelihood of your devices working properly when you get them into the field. Um, so that's a good thing to do if you possibly can. Speaking of activations and getting and sending a little bit of data over the network, how are you gonna send data over the network? <laughs> you gotta have service, right? Um, where are you getting that service from? Do you work directly with an operator? Uh, you know, the, the companies who actually build and deploy and maintain the towers in the field and, and offer the service on those networks. But along with that service, you need to know what sort of SIMs that you're going to need. You know, can you, uh, for example, utilize reprogrammable SIMs, EUICCs or eSIMs? Um, can you uh, simply source the plastic, the removable plastic SIMs? Um, you know, those are another component that you have to think about actually uh, obtaining and, and purchasing and, and putting into your devices as you activate and deploy them. So um, maybe it makes sense to turn to a company that can handle a lot of that stuff for you. Um, certain companies will already have contracted with uh, so some of those other carriers and you simply sign up and get the service that all of those carriers offer, sort of like an MVNO. Um, so just to throw it out there, Nimblelink, for example, at go.nimblelink.com, we offer that kind of capability uh, for device developers just wanting to get something up and running so they don't have to deal with all the contracts and all that kind of stuff. Um, and also longer term for companies who are looking to deploy um, full production runs of, of units. Um, so multiple options for carriers. Once you've deployed your units, once you've just selected a carrier, once you've got units in the field, you might think you've reached the end of the production uh, capabilities, but not quite. Once the devices in the are in the field, you still need to manage them, maintain them. In part two, we talked about firmware over the air, FOTA. Um, firmware over the air, as a reminder, um, allows you to push updated versions of firmware to your device. So the actual device software that is running the device. Um, it also allows you to push updated firmware for the radio module that you're using, um, whether that module exists on a, an embedded modem, whether it's a straight module based design, uh, like something like this. Um, it, it allows you to at least manage that and push those versions of firmware out to those devices in the field. So. Uh, without having to touch anything, without having to, to mess with them, you can keep devices online, keep them maintained, keep them active. Um, and uh, if something does go wrong, a lot of times it's hard to figure out exactly why they went wrong before you can even create the updated firmware that you push via FOTA. So you need to be able to find ways of diagnosing issues. Um, Honestly, the best way to do this is just with simple logging. So keeping track of what your device is doing, what the radio is sending back to your microcontroller or your processor. Um, so if you can log the AT commands, log the URCs, log the activity and the error codes that are coming through, then you can retrieve those and you'll have a much, much easier time diagnosing any issues that you might be encountering in the field. So that's just a, a tip for you on how to make sure that not only uh, can you get your devices to production, but once they are in production, once they've been deployed, you can keep them online, keep them working, uh, keep everything operating as it, sh as it should, and, e and even future-proof. Push out for future updates and make future changes to your devices too. So anyway, um, that's all I wanted to cover in part three here. Um, hopefully this crash course has been helpful. Uh, it's been useful. Thank you to GSMA for uh, involving us in this, but um, let us know what, we, what you think about this type of thing. Should we do more of these crash course type videos? Um, leave your uh, feedback in the comments below. Um, send us an email to workshop at nimblelink.com. Uh, certainly check out the GSMA website. We'll link that down below as well. And uh, until next time on a normal from the workshop video, uh, we'll see you then and have fun building.